Okay, great. Um, welcome everybody to the July uh, rig. Um, we are now called the North American rig. Um, <laughs> we uh, were the US rig and uh, in order to be consistent with our other research address group in, in Europe, um, we're going to um, involve North America. Uh, we do actually have a couple of people working with us from Canada. Uh, and so um, any researchers out there in Mexico who want to <laughs> get involved in a Red Hat research project, please reach out. Um, uh, today, I'm very happy to be able to talk about one of our new collaboratory projects that we're doing with Boston University. Um, and uh, Chris Tate uh, and Alexandra Machado, who are from Red Hat, are going to be uh, giving a description of this project, which will be ongoing. Uh, we're very interested in getting people um, to give us their feedback and possibly join this project. So um, look forward to questions and comments afterwards, um, or if it's okay with you, Chris and uh, Alexandra during. So with Absolutely. that, I believe, I'm not sure which one of you was going to start. <laughs> I can share the slides and then we'll, Alexander will kick it off. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Chris. Okay, one moment. And I'll post a link to the notes in case anyone wants to enter things in the notes. Does everyone see the slides? Yes. Okay, go ahead, Alexandra. Okay, hi everyone. So we're gonna give you a little bit of background and context also before we um, jump into the project and the details of the project that Chris will share with you, kind of where you know where we're at. He will give you a high level of kind of how we're using OpenShift. Um, so, you know, the title of our presentation and, and then we can go more, I mean, if you have any questions or anything, we can go more into detail of what we're doing, but for the sake of this presentation, we're going to focus on how OpenShift is helping to build better solutions for smart cities. So, um, it's basically how to, how are we using open source technologies for social good? of course, in partnership with Boston University and your students and also Smartavia. So um, should we do quick, quick introductions, Chris, if you want to go to the next slide? Um, so that you know who um, who is presenting to you today, I'm Alexander Machado. Um, I lead our Red Hat Global Social Innovation Program, um, and I'm originally from Margarita Island, Venezuela. I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I will give you a little bit more background on the program so that you also understand um, who you're partnering with uh, from the Red Hat side on this specific collaboration with Boston University. Chris? Hi, Christopher Tate. I'm a Red Hat Principal Consultant, and I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I believe that open source software can help communities and build a better world. Some of you may be wondering how to get started. So how I got started with social innovation was I was going to university, Brigham Young University, studying computer science. And a local hunting organization, hunting consulting organization, needed some help building a website. So I figured it, all of this out <laughs> from my small amount of experience in school to launch a website. This website was running on my laptop, connected to an ethernet cable next to the TV, into the closet where there was a router set up. And I forwarded port 80 to my computer and bought a domain name and pointed that the DNS records <laughs> to our static IP address. The problem with all that was that it, I had to be home to manage the server. I couldn't do it remotely. Also, if I moved my laptop, then the whole site went down. So <laughs> I learned a lot about um, how to build sites correctly, deployed on OpenShift uh, in the cloud, which made a huge difference. And the site's still running today in OpenShift. Anyway, so 
we want to share with you how we've deployed the Smart Village project and, and other projects for social innovation on OpenShift and how that's done. Pass it back to you to hear from the wonderful Agzal Andrea Machado more about the social innovation program at Red Hat. Thank you, Chris. So, and we're giving all of you guys this context because we were the ones with you that submitted. So we work with Boston University and we found the right, right, uh, right team, thanks to Ari and, and, and other people. So we connected to the right team. But before going there, of course, we are a program at Red Hat that focuses on um, leveraging what we call our superpowers to contribute to socially impactful open source projects. So what we do, we work with nonprofits um, and that's uh, and also organizations that are trying to do great things for the world. Um, and then we kind of connect the dots. And how do we do that? We basically say, OK, how do we use our products, our services and our skills? And that's what we call our superpowers to help uh, our communities. Uh, and that's how we make the connection. And that's what the program that I lead focuses on. And we wanted to give you this background because it will kind of make sense of, you know, when we come and we share this passion, like, you know, this work also, how we're doing it and how we're partnering with what Boston University, in our opinion, is unique just because we're leading it from this side, like from the social innovation front. And then we're partnering with like one of the best universities in the world to connect those dots so our products your brain power <laughs> and then connected it also to smart Beer, which we'll explain in a little bit you know they have a lot of the work already done with what's smart and sustainable for cities so we connected all of those three um aspects and we're doing this collaboration next slide and then not, um, and I would not stay a lot, a long time here, but a lot of what we do is focus on the power of open source because it's a code that is open. But what does that mean? It means that it's the best platform uh, to solve shared problems for the world. So if we're trying to fight, uh, you know, we're trying to be, have a more sustainable world, we need all sectors also. In this case, you know, we have the university Smart Beer, us all working together on this platform that will be used to, you know, to help sustainability, and and that could only be done when the so when the code is open. So that's where everything that we do is open source, and we wanted to highlight it just because it's so powerful. Um, and you guys are all part of this. So Chris, I don't know if you want to add to to this quick slide. Yeah, the, my favorite part of working during the pandemic was the Red Hat got together to do hackathons to help with social innovation projects. And so we did at least four of them during the pandemic, helping out very different organizations. And the cool thing was is that I saw Red Hatters come in uh, who had experience, who formed groups who wanted to work on the same part of the solution and they formed leadership and broke into groups and uh, contributed back to GitHub projects and learned a lot that day and taught me a lot that day. And it was so cool. So I love working together in an open way on open source projects, as Alexandra mentioned, to help communities like this. Thank you, Chris. And, and, and Chris and, and Chris brings a great point. Like during the pandemic, a lot of cities and countries were trying to track the virus and everyone was trying to do their own little software to do it without knowing that if you do it the, like with an open source solution, everyone could like focus on one and expand it and improve it in, in a shorter period of time and have a better solution. So innovation, you know, could happen quicker and then we could get on top of this virus. So this happened in some ways. Um, I wish it was better. We still have a way to go, but um, a lot of uh, sectors and also the private sector, especially the tech companies are realizing that open source is almost the only way to go to, con to collaborate, right? We need that code open. Next slide. Okay, so we're coming to the kind of the description and then Chris will take you and it will be way more technical, way more in detail. We're just giving you a high level also to give you background and also inspire you, hopefully. So the EcoSmart City project, as we call it, we have, have partnered with Boston University and Smart Beer 
to build an open source technological infrastructure that hopefully a lot of researchers can use to collaborate more effectively and ultimately help define better the link between well-being and eco smart cities so there's an aspect of this platform where we want to kind of bring together we want to build a platform so i, I kind of read the slide um but i i want to give you a perspective of we want to have a platform that all universities and researchers can access so that they could all study together how can a city or a village be more sustainable but also there's a link to happiness um because that's a smart to be here they focus on that they say okay being a sustainable city is great but we want that link to happiness too for example and they gave us this example when we started conversations with them like do having more swings and playgrounds in the city make citizens happier like is that like linked to sustainability and having like more parks because there's more greenery and how does that affect the citizens so there's this holistic view um, and to build that holistic view we need a lot of research done on this right but we also need all that data correlated because what what happens now is that you have a little research here a, 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 another paper here okay what if we have a platform that could do that and it's open uh, of course, there's levels of data privacy and all kinds of things that we're working on with Boston University. Um, so yeah, this is a high level. So I will pass it over to um, to Chris so he can explain what we're actually doing and how we're approaching this first phase of the platform. Great, thanks. The Open API, or the Smart Village project is based on open APIs, which means there's a specification that declares what everything happened, what is there that can happen in the site, the data that you can submit and the data that you can retrieve from the site. And we're working on two special use cases right now to interact with external services to gather live data from Internet of Things nodes to get real-time data of sensors measuring temperature, for example, or measuring the number of cars flowing through an intersection over time. The other use case is interacting with open source applications that can simulate traffic on roads to help understand how if conditions change, how that can affect traffic conditions near school zones or pedestrian areas and information like that. So these this is helping university students study smart city indicators and help them understand the data better in the villages that they're working with. And we're going to jump in and show you more uh, live the site. So we have the site deployed here at smartvillage.computate.org. And we're working on articles to explain how the project works better. I want to jump in and show you the site. Now, I was already logged in here, so let me log out and jump back in. The site is protected through open APIs that are backed by a Red Hat single sign-on server. So there's role-based access control to the data. And here are some of the sensors, for example, that are set up in the village. And we can see more of those by location here, for example. And we can go and see some of the simulated data. Actually, I have this running locally, and this is the newest feature that we've been working on. So let me show you here at my local, I have a bunch of vehicle locations at points in time. And I'm going to set this up first. Let me show the map here. So this is some vehicles in time. Let me increase the number of cars that are loaded onto the street at any given time from 100 to 1,000. And let me go to the stats here and 
get the stats for time in seconds, which allows us to put in some step values here. Let's step every 0.2 seconds, starting at 100 and going to 359 seconds in the simulation and the speed in seconds will do 0.2 as well and then click animate now it might be hard to tell but those little dots there are moving let's zoom in and see more can you see those little pink dots moving around the village um this may be a good point to stop and answer any questions you may have at this point So there's a question in chat from Ari asking how you protect the location privacy of the cars, assuming I, I, I would guess that this was real and not just simulated. Right. So this is simulated vehicle data. And we can, uh, so let me show you here. Actually, this is going to jump into how it's deployed. So let me go to the console. In operate first, where we have this uh, application deployed. And I'll give you some more information there. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to workloads, deployment configs. And here is our smart village view application. You can see it's running here. And this is set up with environment variables. And some of these are secrets. And but let me show you the one here. Traffic. Oh, what is it? Vehicle step. Actually, let's see. So um, off. Off the roles required. So what we can do here is add another auth roles required. And we can put that in. What it is is an, a, an array of roles that are a user can have in the single sign-on server. So for example, if we want only super admins to have access to uh, not IoT node data, but um, vehicle step data, then that's what we can do here is, is define the roles required to be super admin to be able to access this vehicle step data. My, my concern is not with the access control, but with the fact that that location data is available at all. And that means someone who gets permissions now has all kinds of very private information about all these people. So. Right. So that, that is a very valid concern. Right now, we don't actually have live data in the village. And so we aren't worried about that at this point. But yes, these are the types of questions that we need to work with the village. The We, we have biweekly meetings with uh, one of the leaders in the village uh, who helps us understand what data we can share. And he's very sensitive to what is considered private data and what, and keeping that, um, well, they're very concerned about data privacy. So we haven't implemented anything at this point that exposes uh, people's private data to the internet. It's mostly simulated data and a few temperature sensors at this point. Thanks. And, and also data privacy concerns. That's something that, you know, also depending on the, like if researchers are gonna access the platform, you know, we need to be compliant also with, depending on the region. I know in, in Europe, they're very strict. Uh, and the level of, of um, access to the platform too, and the agreement on data. So th there's a couple of things there, but we're also working with the team at Boston University that has like an algorithm to hide all the information so nobody knows where it can come from. So we have different things that we're considering, but 
the data privacy party would definitely be a phase um, you know that we'll cover later on uh, as we develop this platform like what strategies and what what are we going to put in place to take care of um, data privacy you know the any other great questions there's another question from greg um, okay. in the chat he asks if you have any plans to include public transit in the simulation i don't know if there is public transit in the village or not but um, what are your plans for that right so let me just uh look at this here so you can see that a couple of these there's two different vehicle types that are showing on this map at this uh, given time. There's four buses and there's 181 passenger vehicles. So it's hard to tell from uh, here what type they are until we get better icons instead of dots uh, <laughs> for these vehicles. But a nice feature will be to add a bus uh, shape to buses and a car shaped to cars. Grez says, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And Ari and Alexandra said the magic uh, letters GDPR. <laughs> yeah, thank <laughs> you, Ari. <laughs> I, I was trying, I, <laughs> I, was, I, I just said it in different words because there's so many acronyms and sometimes I just say a word, like I'm like, I'm just gonna say it high level. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You got it, thank you. So, um, is this, being implemented in any real city or being tested in any actual place or is it just purely simulated at this point? Uh, so far, the, the Boston University team is very interested in simulating traffic to improve stoplight conditions in the village, uh, to help improve safety around school zones and to reduce pollution and to reduce the amount of time people are stopped at a particular light. So uh, that's our principal focus right now is help enabling them to run their simulations easier live. And so what I've been working on lately is building into the container, the ability to run the Sumo application, which runs simulations and exports simulation data, like the location of cars to an XML file and and then making that indexed in the search engine so that it can be shown on the map. So we don't have the live traffic data at this point. But the APIs are powerful enough that they can bring that live data in and allow you to review that data over time if that's what one village wanted to do. Do you imagine this would be like an opt-in type of thing, or would this be like the law of a village that you know, if you're in this village, you must be in our traffic system? Would it work right. as an opt-in? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, the application has the ability to keep track of each vehicle by ID and by type, but there isn't license plate information or uh, the color of the car or other things at this point. But we definitely need to take those kind of considerations in place when we're working with live data. I think um, if I remember correctly, there's also a civil engineer who's associated with this project, right? So he's used to making the connection between um, the simulation and the live data at, so that they relate to each other and are both useful. Is that Jan? Yeah. Yeah. So it is the intention of the project to have live data as well. It's just not the stage that you're at yet. Yeah, uh, I believe so. So if he, so we've built an API to be able to put that live data in. So if another, um, external partner system wants to populate that data or or if we want to import that I, iot node data 
we have that ability now to pull that data in from an Internet of Things node or many Internet of Things nodes across the village and make that visible. Our simulation completed. <laughs> Yay, all our traffic problems are solved. <laughs> Everyone went to bed. Great. <laughs> if only it worked that way in Boston. <laughs> These are great questions. And, and the rest of the slides, uh, I mean, are up to you. We have uh, jumped in and gone. I, I've went and showed you OpenShift. So what I was going to say here is that the OpenShift environment I just showed you, every website deserves the best in security, high availability, scalability, updates, and storage. And Red Hat OpenShift provides all of these things. And that's why we build the Smart Village project into OpenShift. And I showed you some of the I showed you some of the OpenShift components of the project. There's pods here that are running the applications like the database, the PostgreSQL uh, relational database, the Apache Zookeeper cluster manager, which allows our application to scale. Uh, if we need more load, uh, more power to be able to bring in more data, we can scale up the number of uh, no, uh, pods for the Smart Village application and allow that to import more data because we have it clustered with the Zookeeper cluster manager. It means that a request comes in and it can take that request and send it to any of the pods that are available or on a round robin schedule, for example, and allow those requests to be processed more efficiently. We have config maps that, excuse me, are non-confidential data that relate to how the site is configured. We have secrets that are passwords and other credentials required to connect to the various systems. And we have persistent volume claims to store files like the database requires a persistent volume claim to store database data, and the search engine requires that as well, and the Zookeeper cluster manager needs its own to keep state. And there's replication controllers controlling the number of pods running for all the applications, and services that expose certain ports, like the HTTP port to the site, uh, and then we have, so that's the Kubernetes components. And Kubernetes is for developers to run their applications in the cloud in a well-defined container API with many individual components, as you see here. We have specific OpenShift components that build on top of Kubernetes that add versioning, high availability, and scale security to the site. So the image streams allow us to keep track of the versions of the application deployed, and it can roll back if a version is broken. We have the deployment config that I showed you where we store all of the environment variables to configure authentication, for example, in the site. And it also controls how many pods are deployed and how many and what the health checks are and what the storage is. Then we have the route. And so that's a cool one because this site is running at a domain name that we chose. And so our route is defined in networking routes, smart village view. And this automatically generates the certificates to keep it secure. So this site is valid, and OpenShift can automatically renew 
your certificate over time. So this one will expire on September 4th, but it'll be automatically renewed thanks to OpenShift. So that's an example of how OpenShift really helps us uh, bring this application to life and make it scalable. Now, I was going to hand it back to Alexandra, but are there any questions, technical questions you had still? OK. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, I, I mean, I just wanted to just wrap up and thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. I, I think the most important aspect of what we're trying to share is that you can also be part of this because it's open source. So if you're interested or you work um, in technology and you want to help this project, you can always join us. Um, and if you have any questions, we're here. Or you can reach out later if you come up with more questions. Yeah, so you can get more details. At the project's running at smartvillage.compute.org. And if you go there, it has a link to the GitHub. So that's, that's where it's all open source. So I can share this in the meet. And also, Red Hat has all kinds of training available for becoming an OpenShift administrator or an OpenShift developer of applications. And the automation that we've built into the site to deploy it, it there's courses for all of that. So it's a great uh, chance to get up to speed on your skills through Red Hat courses and certifications and, and help either build your own project for you communities that are important to you or join with our project as well. So thanks. Yeah, I wonder if, Alexander, you might say a little bit more about that because there are some people here who are working on sensors and working on other kinds of Internet of Things applications. And um, I don't want people to get the feeling that all you're doing is cars. Um, how how do you think you're going to connect with people if they have other kinds of um, data that would come from Internet of Things devices that they'd like to explore um, putting into this OpenShift platform or connecting up to other villages? Yeah, of course. Um, so the first thing is that w since we're in the first phase of the building the platform, we're just doing one use case, and that's the one. And then we're we're doing simulations instead of live, just because of the data concerns too. So it's easier to kind of build the platform and the concept uh, in this kind of initial phase that we're calling like you know minimal viable products. Um, so as we evolve in different phases, we might test other use cases and include you know more devices, more um use cases again um and then from there we can work with other teams and other cities to expand on the on what the platform looks like and refine it as we evolve the platform so with all of that said if you're interested in in working on the platform or have any questions or have ideas of where you could work um you want to work with us just reach out to us i mean i can provide the email um of chris and i and you can reach out and we will connect you to the you know to the right team so um i will leave the i don't know heidi if you want to send an email with our contact information or should i put it in chat um i can put it in the notes from the meeting and that way perfect. anybody who finds the recording can find the emails as well that's perfect yep that would be great okay thank you also to build on that the project's open source, which means if you want to work on something, uh, if you want to enhance it in your own way, you can fork the project, make your own fork, and build your own APIs. And if, it, if, if it's something really good that you want to contribute back, then you make a pull request, and we review it and think, oh, yeah, this is great. We can build on this and bring it in. So that's the power of open source again. Yeah, like you don't Fantastic. need permission. <laughs> yeah, it's open. Yeah. 
but uh, yeah, that that's great. Thank you, Chris, for bringing that up. So, and you can always reach out to if you have questions or um, ideas too. Yeah, and the project page with the information on the repo and uh, the slides um, will be available after this talk too, um, and the links are in the notes. So thank you very much for joining. Um, appreciate getting a chance to see something a little different about how research and social good can combine. Um, and look forward to hear more about this project. Well, thank you, Heidi, and thank you everyone for your time and you know your consideration for, for letting us share all of this uh, work. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Chris and Alexander. Thank you so much for bringing us in. I really appreciate it, <laughs> glad to share. Okay, and we'll see you all next month. There will be another 